April 17, 2000, and I'm about to become a very rich man. <laughs> Eight years before that, for perspective, I was living in a garage in Berkeley, um, working part-time for a bicycle company, owned a small bakery that was losing about $20,000 a year. The most expensive thing I owned was an Italian racing bicycle. And now, my business partner and I are about to sell Cliff Bar, the company we both own 50% of, to Quaker Oats for $120 million. My take, $60 million. I'll never have to work another day the rest of my life. So before I tell you what happened in those last few hours, um, we were all we had to do at that point was head over to San Francisco, meet the lawyers, the bankers, the executives from Quaker, sign some documents, and the money gets wired into my account. I want to tell you a little story first about a bike ride that changed my life and prepared me for that moment. It's 1986, and I tell my friend, Jay, meet me in Lucerne. We're going to ride the Alps and the Dolomites. The passes that you would see in the Tour of Switzerland, the Tour de France, or the Giro d'Italia. Our method of travel was to go as light as possible. We didn't have a lot of money. We weren't hiring support. We weren't going to travel with big bags like this because you wouldn't even be able to make it over the passes with that kind of weight. So we traveled in what we call the bare essentials, and we carried whatever we could fit into a shoebox or this pack. I'm, this is an actual pack I took on a trip this last year. How about living in that, for, living with this much stuff for 16 days? Well, that's what we did. And we stayed in little, uh, we, didn't, we couldn't camp with that kind of gear, so we stayed in pensions or zimmers and cheap hotels. Now, if any of you have... And if any of you are cyclists um, and you like riding up big hills, um, I want to show you a few pictures over the years. I've taken hundreds of pictures of tr many trips I've done, and I just want to show you, to give you a little taste of what it's like to ride over there. Some of the most beautiful terrain in the world. This is the Paso Gavia. This is the Stelvio. This next one is the, the St. Goddard. I mean, look at those roads. Don't you all want to ride up those roads right now? This next one is the San Giacomo, heading from Italy back into Switzerland. This next one, we're screaming down the hill um, called the Col de la Croix in, in Switzerland. So day one of this trip, this first trip I did, um, Jay and I are heading out of town, and we're about 15 minutes down the road, and all of a sudden we hear this horn, like somebody honking at us. And the next thing you know, this guy pulls over, jumps out of his car, and we're thinking, oh, great, we're 15 minutes into our ride, and we're already going to be attacked in Switzerland. And so the guy jumps out, and he's all amped up, and we're like, what is going on? He says, you're not supposed to be on this road. This is an Autobahn. We're like, well, I guess it is. <laughs> we were so obsessed with getting to that first pass, the Grosser Scheidig, which heads over to the Eiger that we didn't even care. We're just jamming down the road. So he looked, we pulled out our map and we showed him and he said, you know, there's so many better roads than this. These small, beautiful roads for cycling. It's going to take you longer to get to that pass and that's a wonderful pass, by the way. But, um, and you'll, you'll just love the ride more and, and so we looked at the map and we, those, those roads weren't even on our map. We had the wrong scale map. So we ended up finding our way and we did find some better maps that had those roads in them. And this is a Michelin map, and on Michelin maps, there's kind of three general colors of roads. There's red, yellow, and white. And the red road is the fastest way from point A to point B, although it's kind of the most dangerous, and you get honked at by people when you're on them. Um, the yellow is the intermediate, and the white roads are those small little roads that he was referring to. So from that point forward, we knew, as cyclists, why would we want to ride on any other road but the white roads? So every day we would study the map for the next day and make sure that our route was on the white road as much as possible. So on day seven of our 16-day trip, we found ourselves up here in the town of Cormier, Italy. And we're heading, and we were at lunch at this Italian restaurant. Well, we're in Italy, so I guess every restaurant there is Italian. So... <laughs> So we're sitting in this restaurant, and we're mapping out the rest of the day, and we're heading north, Switzerland, way up there. And we realize, oh, crud, we've got to take a red road all the way down through here, Aosta, and up over a very nice pass, but all red roads. 
And then we looked a little closer and we realized, wait a second, there's a white road that goes up where it says white road and a dead end. And then there's this obviously big mountain range and this pass called the Col Foray. And on the other side, there's a white road. And we're like, well, if we can just connect those two, then we can just stay on the white road all day. So we asked the waiter and we think the translation was something like, uh, we, he said all this stuff and then he said, you are crazy. <laughs> and we said, and then we thought, well, he didn't tell us you can't go over. He just said we're crazy. <laughs> so we went for it. And real quickly, I'd love to tell you the whole story, but the day was just magical. And here we were. Oops, oh, sorry, Kate. Kate's back there helping me. So we're going up, and it's obviously not a road. It's a dirt road. And back then, mountain bikings were in infancy. So we're riding road bikes over this stuff. And people are stopping along the way with ice axes and packs and stuff. And you kind of look at us like, what are you guys doing? And yet, here we were, we got to see some of the most beautiful terrain in the world. Glaciers, 2,000 foot rock faces. Um, and we ended up, you know, having to carry our bikes. So what? Here's the guy with his ice axe, he came back and took a picture for us. So, we made it to our destination that night, and we celebrated taking the white road. And this white road, red road thing, became like a, a, a metaphor for me, for, for my life, and ended up for business too. And the red road being the fastest way from point A to point B, the most predictable, the route of conventional wisdom, but you know, noisy and, and so on. The white road, quieter, more beautiful, uh, more sustaining, uh, more rewarding, and really a heck of a lot more fun. So the bike for me has been like a mentor. Long, long rides on desolate roads, um, has, the bike has become my mentor. And um, in fact, Cliff Bar was actually born on one of those long bike rides. So this time it's 1986, uh, I'm sorry, that was 86, 1990. And um, another long one day, 175 mile bike ride in the Bay Area with my friend Jay, now ER Dr. Jay Thomas. And we are um, really fast forward, uh, 175 miles, we're at mile 125, we're at the top of Mount Hamilton in San Jose. And it's getting late, we kind of misjudge things, it's, we're cold, we're tired, we're bonk, and we are so hungry. And that day I brought along six power bars. And at the time, uh, in 1990, power bar was the only energy bar on the market. And I had eaten five that day, I'd never eaten more than two in one day. And I had five. And I'm, I need to eat something. And I pull that last one out and I look at it and I say, there's no way, I cannot choke this last one down. Well, fortunately, it was downhill all the way into San Jose, and I knew there was a 7-Eleven there. Rode down to that 7-Eleven, walked in there, and bought a package of powdered donuts. <laughs> Anybody want to try these? <laughs> Come on. No takers? There we go. Here we go. Nice catch. <laughs> <laughs> so, on the way down the hill, something significant happened. And here I am, I, I have a problem. I need to eat, and I can't even eat the thing I've got. It's food. And so, I remember turning to Jay, and probably kind of intensely, like I do with Jay a lot, and probably riding 30 miles an hour down the hill with one hand, one hand on the handlebar, and looking at Jay and going, Dude, I can make a better energy bar than that. And that was it. That's what I said. And without that moment, I don't think I'd be standing here. I mean, it's amazing to think that all these things came together and that one second happened and then that was it. Thankfully, I followed up on the idea. The next day I called my mom who developed all the recipes for the bakery that I owned and said, Mom, I'm coming to your kitchen. We're making an energy bar. Six months later, we came out with our first three flavors of Cliff Bar. Apricot, chocolate, and date oatmeal. I Told, I asked a good friend of mine, Doug Gilmore, to design the package, and he came up with this wonderful climber image that's iconic for Cliff Bar, named it after my father, Clifford, and in 1992, February, we launched Cliff Bar. And first year, we did $700,000 in sales. Now, the bake, that's twice as much as the bakery had done in any given year that I owned. And then, 
the next eight years, we went from 700000 to $39 million without any debt and any investors. It was crazy. It was like a white road bike trip times 100. It was such a blast. It was so intense, and I had so much fun. Yet, when you grow a company that fast, it doesn't happen without issues, difficulties. And we had them all, any startup would. You know, manufacturing, quality, employees, legal, lawsuits, you name it, we had it. On top of that, there was growing tension between my partner and I. And then, in early 2000, a, a very big thing happened in our industry. Um, Power Bar, that competitor that we were competing against, was sold to Nestle, the largest food company in the world. And Balance Bar, our other big competitor at the time, was sold to Kraft, the second largest food company in the world. And now the whole game had changed. People were saying, you're never going to make it. These guys are going to kill you. They were saying, you know, either sell the company, go in partnership with somebody, do something. On top of that, um, uh, so then in a, um, a quick decision, um, I went along with my partner's overwhelming decision to sell the company, to sell it before it starts going backwards, and to sell it while the getting is good. I started the business on $1,000. And how many years later, and I can walk away with $60 million in my bank account? Is that not the American dream? Huh? What kind of idiot would turn that down and walk away from a deal like that? I'll tell you in a second. So here I am, standing in the office, waiting to go over to San Francisco to sign those documents and have the money wired in my account, never have to work again. And I have, I'm starting to have trouble breathing. So I look at my partner and I said, I gotta take a walk around the block. I head outside and I just I just burst out crying. And I take I'm walking around the block, and halfway around the block, I pause, dead in my tracks, and I think, why am I doing this? And then I realized I don't have to do this. I don't have to sell the company. And instantly I felt pure joy and freedom. And I didn't care what it entailed. Well, what it did entail was going the rest of the way around the block and telling my partner about my newfound freedom. <laughs> and it didn't go over very well, which then led to seven months of negotiation to buy her out. So instead of having $60 million into my bank account, I'm now $60 million in debt plus interest. What kind of idiot would do that? <laughs> well, here we are now with freedom to do it any way we wanted. Now it's... This, well, the second thing we had to do was kind of reconvince our, well, convince our employees that we could compete because we had told them we got to sell the company, we're never going to make it. And now, okay, I, I was wrong. <laughs> Just kidding. And so, so, but yet now we had the freedom to do it any way we wanted. My wife is here today, Kit, she's the co-CEO. Co it was our decision now. And so, we had this, we could have put Cliff Bar on the red road. We could have maybe doubled the sales and then doubled that deal, right? 60, 100, 120. So that could, that would have been a red road thing. But I, I didn't, I didn't want to sell the company. I wanted to keep it private. So, but another thing we could have done on the red road, putting Cliff Bar on the red road would, as a private company, would have been to focus 100% on paying off that debt. I mean, it makes sense, right? Pay the debt off. This is, a it was, one and a half times our annual sales, $60 million, or we're doing $40 million. No, we did not want to wait to run the kind of company we wanted to work for. So over the next two years, we developed a set of values with the whole company. Just like you all here, we talked and talked for two years straight about what kind of company do we want to be. And out of that, kind of, this is the very abridged version, we came up with our value system and we call our five aspirations. So instead of having one bottom line, like focusing all, all for profit and growth, we had five bottom lines that were sort of equally weighted. And they are sustaining our business, our brands, our people, our community, and the planet. So let me just give you a couple ideas. And this, these, these values, by the way, cost us millions of dollars that could have been put towards paying off that debt. So let me just give you a really quick, out of the 100 things we did over the last 12 years, I'm going to give you like five highlights. 
So we were never organic. We went organic. About 250 million pounds of organic to date. Next. We, uh, we created a community service program, allowing our employees to do community service on company time. To date, we've done 40,000 hours of community service. Next. We put in a world-class gym with our own personal trainers, full-time trainers, and we even pay our people to work out 30 minutes a day. That's weird, huh? We put, on our, in our new facility, we put a child care center, something we, my wife had dearly wanted to do for years, and we finally did it. It's for our employees. It's unbelievable. Next, we, um, then in our new facility, um, we, we put a solar panel on the top to power our, our office needs. And all along, we invested in innovation. And since then, we've, we've launched 12 new product lines. So you may say, yeah, this is all cool, but did you actually grow the business? <laughs> well, yes, we did. Over the last 12 years, we've grown double-digit compound growth for 12 years straight. And we did pay off that debt. So 12 years ago, people would say to my wife and I, but you could have done so many good things with that money. And her line's the best. It's, but we can do so much more with the power of our company, our brands, and our people. On top of that, I know I wouldn't have been happier had I sold the company than I am today. I would have regretted that decision the rest of my life. It would have been like walking off the field at halftime and not coming back to finish the game. Or better yet, being plucked off the mountain, hiking up the Col Foray, helicopter taken home. End of story. I didn't start the journey to end the journey. I started the journey to stay on the journey. So if you ever find yourself being drawn toward a red road and something doesn't feel like, feel right, like you're having trouble breathing, take a walk around the block or a hike or a long bike ride. And I hope at the end of your walk, you feel the same pure joy and freedom I felt after my walk on April 17, 2000.